Our first, first speaker uh, is uh, Gordon Stove. Uh, Gordon's uh, co-founder and managing director of Adrock, uh, a company um, based on using uh, atomic dielectric resonance technology used predominantly for the hydrocarbon and mineral industries. He's a BSc Honours Graduate in Geography from the University of Edinburgh and he's helped develop Adrock's uh, intellectual property portfolio, manage its technology developments and its global services. Uh, Gordon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much, ESEG, for giving us the opportunity to, to explain our technology here today. So, um, atomic dielectric resonance. It's, it's a name that we've invented. It's a name that we've made up. Um, there are other dielectric resonance technologies out there, um, but I'll, I'll explain a bit more about what, what uh, we have here. So it's a, it's a radar device, so and traditionally uh, it's a radio, radio detection and ranging and visually opaque materials. We transmit pulsed uh, broadband frequencies into the ground. Uh, so depending on the, the depth of investigation that we're trying to get to, uh, we can operate between 100 kilohertz or all the way up to, to 1 gigahertz. For large depth mineral exploration, I mean, we typically use uh, 1 megahertz to 100 megahertz. Uh, the, the example that we're going to show today with City Gold, um, we, we operated around about 3 megahertz to 10 megahertz range for, for getting down uh, 500 to 800 meters uh, penetration. So we send uh, these broadband pulses into the ground and uh, we detect the modulated reflections from the, from the earth that, that come back. The, the rock property we measure is dielectric permittivity and we also um, analyze the returns uh, in, the, in the form of FFT analysis and we can analyze the energy, frequency, and phase uh, relationships, uh, the spectral content of the, of the returns that come back. So this is our, our field scanner. So we've got um, uh, a bi-static um, system. So we've got one, one transmitter and we've got one receiver. And they can move together in tandem or they can be separated uh, for, for distance. We've got a, a pulse generator system which uh, sets up the transmit pulses. We've got a, a radar control units here um, to, to collect the returns and analyze the returns. And uh, we then have a, an A to D conversion back into a PC tablet um, to display the data coming in real time. We also operate in the laboratory setting as well. So we, um, we have a, 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 an ADR core scanner system so we can scan rock samples and train, train the system on the, the types of spectral information that comes back from different rock types. Uh, this particular presentation, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the, the spectroscopy side of our technique. Uh, I'll be focusing ma mainly on the penetration and the pro propagation of the, the beams through the ground. So as a, a system diagram, um, we've we, uh, set up a, a pulse here. So it's a, a sine wave uh, pulse that we, we set up. Uh, it's basically a, a large blip. We send it into our, our antennas, and our antennas are, are optically designed. So there's uh, optics inside the, the antennas which uh, act as a waveguide for the transmission. So by the time it comes out of the aperture end here, which is an end firing uh, transmitter, we've got a pulse here uh, in this, this sort of shape. Uh, and that's the, the energy curve of the, of the transmission. The, the reflections that come back from the, the ground are, are very complex and very complicated. Um, signals. I mean, they, this is an example of a, a return from the, the subsurface. So we get all sorts of resonance and reflections and refractions back from the, the subsurface. And then we've got to, to analyze the returns um, coming back, um, which we've got some, some software that does, does that. So in the field, the software comes in, uh, so the software displays the, the returns as a, an amplitude stretch. So here's the amplitude returns um, from the, the subsurface. In terms of the, the specifications of our system, I mean, the, the maximum frequencies that we operate um, are, are up here, sort of 12.5 megahertz up to, to 10 gigahertz. The minimum frequencies are 10, 100 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. The time range that we, we operate, I mean, it's all a time domain measurement that we, we measure. So it's all, all in nanoseconds of time. And depending on how deep you want to go, I mean, we, we have to have a, a longer dwell time to go deeper into the ground. Uh, so we can go up to 250,000 nanoseconds of, of time. Um, we pu pulse uh, lots of traces into the ground, so that we've got a high pulse rep repetition frequency. And the, the power, sorry, the, the, the power that we send into the ground is, uh, is very low. So that we transmit a power in, in milliwatts of power. So it's a maximum five milliwatts of power that we send into the ground. 
In terms of the, the optics that we, we use, um, I mean, we borrowed optics, uh, physics from, from satellite, uh, sorry, from um, telescope um, and optics uh, techniques. So inside the, the transmitter, we, we emit, uh, we emit uh, photons into this, the chamber here. And initially, they, they, they operate in a sort of random fashion, and then they, they resonate inside the chamber uh, and come into a phased um, setting. And by the time it uh, transmits from the, the transmitter, we've got a what we call a, prog a progressive standing wave, uh, which keeps its shape through the, through the subsurface. So the, the transmitter acts like a, a larger antenna than the, the physical size. The physical size of the antenna, as you see in this, um, in, a, in later pictures, is around about a meter in length. But because we fold our transmitter inside the, the chamber, and we resonate inside the chamber, the, the, chamber, the transmitter is around about sort of 70 to 100 meters in length by the time it comes out of the in, in air. In the, in the ground, our, our waves are around about 30 meters in, in wavelength. And by separating the, the transmitter and the receiver, um, we can create a, a synthetic aperture radar uh, effect, which increases the wavelength as well. So in the field, we, we collect various scans. Um, one, one scan that we collect is what we call a WAR scan, which stands for Wide Angled Reflection and Refraction. Um, so that's separating the, the transmitter and receiver uh, a certain distance along a, a scan line. And because we're separating the, the transmitter and receiver, we're creating that synthetic aperture, creating the, the transmission beam uh, to make it uh, look a lot bigger than it actually is. So we've got a, a, a simulation of the, the water beam going through the ground. So if you, you see the transmission going from the top to the bottom there, um, this uh, synthetic aperture radar effect that we're creating um, keeps its, its shape a lot larger than, than it uh, has been emitted from its aperture. And it's also very coherent as well through the ground. So it's keeping the shape and the center, central frequency is very s stable through the ground. Um, another scan that we can do is moving the transmitter and the receiver together in tandem, and we call this a P-scan or a profile scan. So this gives us a, a 2D cross-section of the subsurface, which allows us to, give a, to create an image of the, the subsurface. So it's basically just a, slice through the, a vertical slice through the ground. Um, typically, we have the transmitter and receiver very close together. They're about uh, 0.3 meter um, separation. Um, the reason we have it, that separation is because we know that uh, the radio waves travel at one, one foot per nanosecond, um, so we can clearly distinguish the, the airwave from the scan. Um, typically, we, al we also ping uh, a, a transmission pulse every five centimeters, so it's constantly collecting data along the scan line. Um, another scan that we do is, is what we termed a stair scan, um, so it's basically the, the antenna is stationary on the surface, just looking into the ground to collect, collect traces uh, and returns. Again, we have a separation of uh, 0.3 meters um, for that one foot per nanosecond in, for the airwave, and we, we stack the traces together um, to, to enhance the signal-to-noise ratio, and it helps us quantify the noise levels um, coming back. So we can stack up to, up to 100,000 traces uh, in a stair scan. Um, so we've been working with uh, the University of British Columbia to, to stimulate, simulate our, our, uh, our pulses in the ground and our returns. We've developed uh, various models with, uh, with them. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it just now, but we can talk about it uh, with the professor after, afterwards in the discussion session. Um, but in essence, I mean, the, the, the ground model that we're, we're creating, I mean, we're measuring the permittivity, conductivity, and polarization uh, effects. And we've, we've developed uh, various models and equations to, to do that. So one, one example of a simulation here, um, we've got the, the transmit pulse, which you'll see in the red line coming in. And the bottom graph is uh, the dielectrics of the ground conditions. So this one's a real life uh, empirical measurement. So we've got a, a water body here at uh, 350 meters down the, down the earth column. And when we send our beams into the ground, I mean, they travel 
fairly consistently, like standing, standing waves through the ground. And then we get a, a big reflection back from the, from the water body. Um, further details of this particular experiment were presented at the, the SEG uh, this year in Denver. Um, so there's a presentation on our, our website if you want to go into more detail about this as well. Um, we can, because we have a, a directional beam, end firing beam, um, we can actually measure uh, the, the beam itself. So we can do a transillumination scan, which is uh, separating the, the receiver uh, and the transmitter and pointing them at each other. So we can measure the actual transmission that comes out of our, our system. And we, we do this um, on various occasions just to calibrate the system and uh, make sure that we're setting up the correct beams for different, different settings. Um, and this, this graph here shows that the central frequencies of the, of the beam are uh, very directional. Um, and we can do this through a, through a compass direction all the way around the, the transmitter to make, measure exactly where the beam is going. And uh, that was an example in air, but we can also do this in rock as well if we've got access to, to looking through uh, either side of a rock, rock body. Um, and this, this again was presented at the, the SEG conference in Denver. Um, but yeah, we, we get nice returns back from the, from the, the rock and we can distinguish um, exactly how it's tra traveling through the rock and we can catch the, the returns through the rock. We know exactly the, the air wave as well, so we can measure the, where the air wave is, um, which demonstrates that it is actually going through, through the rock. In this particular example, we went, uh, went 120 meters through, through a rock body. And we, we did this particular experiment underground as well, so we, we knew exactly where, where the beams were going. Um, so there was no interference from the surface uh, for any, any vegetation or trees, exam for example, um, that uh, would give us reflections. So it was all reflections purely from, from the rock body. In terms of the, the equipment sensitivity, um, we, we frequently measure the, the equipment sensitivity and we do this as a part of our quality system within the company. And we go to various external bodies uh, just to measure the, the amount of energy and transmissions that are coming out of our, our system. Um, one question that was asked before the presentation was, uh, how, how does this radar device compare to traditional or classical ground penetrating radars? Um, I mean, by, by comparison, I mean, the, the frequency ranges that we're using are very similar to ground penetrating radar. Um, traditional pe ground penetrating radar gets a sort of maximum distance of about 40, 40 to 50 meters, depending on the, the material. Um, but lower frequency devices have been developed by other, other organizations. Um, ESA, the European Space Agency, and NASA have developed a system in Mars, uh, the Mars-SIS experiment, which they, they've demonstrated they can go, go deep into the ground. And there's, uh, there's been work done on Antarctica as well, which is going deep into the ground. Now, this is a, a classic um, textbook uh, example of the sort of frequencies and propagation ranges of ground penetrating radar devices. Uh, this was published by, by Reynolds in 1997. Um, so in terms of uh, the work that we did at City Gold, which was the next presentation, uh, we were operating in a, in a granite context here, um, and we were using sort of frequencies under 10 megahertz uh, of frequency. So we, we are getting very deep, deep penetration uh, in a classical sense as well as uh, our, our new approach. Um, I mean, this, this slide's probably going to be where you press the pause button after, the, after you see the video here. There's a lot of text here. But in general terms, I mean, the, the, the differences from our system and GPR is that we, we use a pulse system. Uh, we send multiple frequencies into the ground, so it's not just one monochromatic frequency we send into the ground. Um, we have measured deep penetration in the ground for various projects now. We've got multiple projects that have gone beyond 200 meters up to 600 meters. Uh, even in the oil and gas industry, we've gone uh, a lot, lot deeper than that as well. Um, in terms of the, the antennas, the antennas are completely different uh, from ground penetrating radar. We've borrowed science from, from optics and used telescopic lenses to create a, a resonance effect when we transmit into the ground. Uh, most other systems are flat, flat uh, sort of dipole systems which need to be in contact with the ground. We, we don't need to be in contact with the ground. 
And we, um, we condition the, the signal that we put into the ground uh, before it emits the, from our antennas. So we, we have a, a resonating or a lasing effect with our, our signals that we transmit into the ground. Um, this is an example which I pulled off the, the Morsis website, which is freely available um, to, to download. But they, they've uh, purported that they've gone down 3.7 kilometers through the, through the Mars, Mars rock. Um, and again, they've been using low frequencies, uh, one to five megahertz range, and they also use low power as well, uh, five, 500 watts of, of power. So in terms of the, the measurements we, we take, um, one, one measurement is the, the dielectrics of the rocks that, uh, that we, we measure. So this is an example of a, a typical dielectric log through the ground. And this is the depth axis here, and that's the dielectric uh, value at the top. And in this particular example, this is going through, through hard rock. This is for one of our mining clients in, in Europe. So we're, we're transmitting into basalt at the surface. That was a surface outcrop rock. And when we presented our results to the client, <coughs> they, they married up our, our dielectrics with the, the drill logs after they, they drilled the site. And they found that uh, every single high dielectric spike through the system, they found that there was, there was either broken ground or very broken ground um, caused by faulting um, within their system. And they, they, re they related our high dielectrics to, to the moisture content of the, of the ground. So that's how we're getting this high spike uh, in dielectrics. <coughs> Um, we also measure what we call the, the energy returns of the ground. So um, we transmit uh, power into the ground and we measure the, the effect that comes back. And uh, we, we use an FFT analysis to, to, to measure the energy returns. And again, we can display this as a curve or we can display this as a, an image um, using a, an amplitude stretch. Uh, we can also analyze the, the frequencies that come back from the, the ground. Um, so we, we transmit frequencies into the ground, they get modulated and they're affected by the, the earth. And we can present this as a, again as a curve or, or as an image of contrast uh, that comes back from the, from the subsurface. And typically our, we, we combine all the measurements together. So we've got all these tools in our toolbox which we, we present as a, a composite log to, to our clients. Um, so we have a, a log of the, the, uh, the dielectrics, the energy, the frequency. We can create lithological columns of the subsurface um, based on these measurements. And combined with the spectral content of the, of the analysis, we can, we can classify the rock types and the mineral, mineral content of the, of the layers in the ground. Um, I mean, something that we're very big on, and this is something that our inventor of the technology was very big on, was, was signals intelligence, or, or signet. Um, so he, he, from his, his military and uh, academic background, I mean, he, he's been analyzing signals um, and using the signals to, to quantify uh, what's coming back from the signals. So I mean, this, this is something that we're very big at uh, with, the, with the company, and we've been, been analyzing the, the different types of material returns and effects that come back from the signals um, with our, our technology. Um, so in essence, I mean, that, that is basically what atomic dielectric resonance is. It's a, it's a radar device. We, we operate uh, for deep mining operations between one megahertz and 100 megahertz of range. We pulse the, the, the beam. So it's uh, broadband frequencies that we continually pulse into the ground. And we measure the dielectric permittivity. And through spectral analysis, we can measure the, the energy frequency and phase relationships that come back. So that's, that concludes my, my section. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. And um, you've left yourself plenty of time for some questions before we start the, the main question block. So I'll, I'll open it up to questions. But before I do, if, if you could just uh, uh, identify yourself, and I'll pass you a mic so that we can record your question properly. Uh, yeah, Matthew Josh, um, petrophysicist from CSIRO. Um, I specialise in dielectric measurement at CSIRO. But it's not quite clear what this log is. It is actually a radar log or a dielectric log? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we, we, 
we can produce an image log of the, the subsurface through our, our p-scans that I mentioned. But uh, yeah, we, we tend to, to prefer to display our results as a, as a petrophysical type of log. So we, we can present dielectric logs, energy logs, frequency logs, and phase, phase logs. So, so the single log trace that you were displaying, what exactly was it? Was it the, the, the time of flight of the pulse to the target and then back again? Or was it actually the dielectric permittivity of the formation you were going through? Because it didn't, the logs I saw didn't look particularly exciting. They just looked like a whole bunch of wiggly lines. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the measured dielectrics of the, of the subsurface um, using Dial our it's like dielectric permittivity, yeah. Well, we, we say, as I said, we... Because the dielectric permittivity of rock changes quite a bit at different frequencies. Yep. And you're talking yep. about uh, propagating energy in a number of different frequencies from tens of megahertz to gigahertz. So what is the dielectric permittivity of? The formation at what frequency? Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. So in, in the traditional uh, radar range... Uh, uh, Keys, if you could just uh, yeah. wait for the mic. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce it. Uh, this is uh, um, Keys Van... Van uh, Vandel, who's the co-author. Yeah, so uh, so in uh, uh, typically the range from mega one megahertz to one gigahertz, the uh, the velocity is constant, so the electric primitive, the real part does not change. Oh, okay. <laughs> the dielectric permittivity of some rocks at a gigahertz can be as low as five or six granite, um, and that may be quite flat across the frequency range, but if you go into a shale or a wet rock, that most certainly won't be the case. The dielectric permittivity at a megahertz can be 10,000. So, so... Maybe, maybe. We'll, we'll have to cut the questions there and um, make a start on Simon's presentation, uh, but... Uh, be assured there's plenty of time for questions at the end.